Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Living New Deals webinar series. My name is Bridget Boyle, and I am your technical assistant today. Should you run into any issues, you can message me directly in the chat or uh, put a message letting us know that you're having technical difficulties. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We ask that you uh, put your questions in the Q&A so that we can easier track them and make sure to address as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Um, and with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Susan Ives. Hi, and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, New Deal Photography Through the Lens of Arthur Ross Stein. I'm Susan Ives. I'm with the Living New Deal, a nonprofit organization in Berkeley, California, popularizing the idea of a new New Deal. The Living New Deal was founded at UC Berkeley about a dozen years ago. Our mission is to preserve the New Deal's legacy nationwide, make people aware of what the New Deal was and did, and to promote the New Deal as a model of leadership and good government. Our website, livingnewdeal.org, features an interactive map documenting some 17,000 New Deal sites across the country, including post offices, parks, schools, roads, city halls, public art, and more. The website also provides a wealth of information about New Deal policies, programs, and the people who were instrumental in guiding the nation through this pivotal time in history. Please sign up to receive our newsletter, The Fireside and invitations to special events and programs like this. Tonight's webinar is the last we'll be offering this summer. We hope to see you in September for our new webinar series, working title, Makers of the Lost Art. Our September 22nd webinar will feature Susan Quinn, the biographer of Hallie Flanagan, who headed the New Deal's intrepid and short-lived Federal Theater Project. Our guest tonight is Dr. Annie Rothstein Sagan. She is the creator and presenter of educational lectures and photographic exhibits and is co-founder with Brody Hefner of the Arthur Rothstein Legacy Project, which shares the extraordinary life and accomplishments of Annie's father, photojournalist Arthur Rothstein. Arthur Rothstein began his career with the New Deal's Resettlement Administration capturing some of the most recognized images of Americans struggling through the Great Depression. You can join the conversation by writing questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Annie will answer as many as possible after her presentation. Thank you for your interest and for tuning in tonight. We hope you will enjoy the program and will join us again for more Living New Deal webinars this fall. Your donations make our work and programs like this available to everyone free of charge. Um, now I'm happy to welcome Annie Sagan and thank you for being with us tonight, Annie. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for all you do for the Living New Deal. I really appreciate your hard work. Ready? Okay, here we go. All right. Well, I'm very pleased to be here on Zoom with all of you on behalf of the Living New Deal. I'm excited to be able to share a unique perspective on the New Deal through the lens of my father, Arthur Rothstein. He was a social documentary photographer, photojournalist, writer, and educator. President Franklin Roosevelt implemented sweeping New Deal programs to help people cope with the Great Depression. He had a remarkable ability to connect with people in person and through the mass communication media of his time. Most of you are familiar with his intimate fireside chats that reached Americans by radio. But in this pre-television era, FDR also needed compelling visual imagery to advance his ambitious New Deal agenda. 
photography was central to the administration's wide-ranging media strategies. My father was a leading member of a small group of New Deal photographers who provided the images Roosevelt needed. This small group of photographers also produced a comprehensive historical record of the nation during the late 1930s and early 40s. Dad made this photo in the spring of 1936 for one of these New Deal programs when he was just 20 years old. This picture of Oklahoma farmer Art Coble and his two boys, Milton and Darrell, became an iconic image of the Great Depression and the severe drought and so-called Dust Bowl conditions of the Great Plains. Dad's Dust Bowl image was one of the most widely reproduced photographs of the 20th century. It was such an iconic image that it's included on the cover of this book, A World History of Photography. You can see it up there. There it is. I'll return to the story behind this picture in a few minutes, but first, let me tell you about how my dad became a social documentary photographer for the New Deal. My dad's parents had been forced from their homes in Eastern Europe by government-sanctioned anti-Jewish pogroms. They joined the wave of two million Jews who immigrated to America from the 1880s to the 1920s. Dad was born in 1915 in New York City. That's my father on the left when he was about 10 years old. There he is, isn't he cute? The family stories he heard about persecution and his, and his parents' struggle to settle in America contributed to Dad's lifelong fascination with the plight of migrants, refugees, and people dispossessed by forces beyond their control. Dad took an immediate interest in photography when he received a camera for his bar mitzvah. At 15, he graduated from Stuyvesant High School in New York City. In those days, boys younger than 16 wore knickers, not trousers. That's him in front, right there front and center in his high school graduation picture. At 16, Dad entered Columbia University, also in New York. He set up the University Camera Club and invited leading photographers, including the pioneering social documentary photographer Lewis Hine, to speak before the club. These are members of the Camera Club posing on the newly opened George Washington Bridge over the Hudson River between New York and New Jersey. At Columbia, Dad met a faculty member, Roy Stryker, who would change his life and the direction of his career. Stryker was preparing a heavily illustrated textbook, and he hired Arthur to make photocopies for the book. Before he could finish the book, Stryker was called to Washington, D.C. to work for a New Deal agency called the Resettlement Administration. His job was to document the need for government programs and to show their impact on the daily lives of Americans. Stryker believed that photographs held enormous potential for advancing social justice and education, so he assembled a team of photographers referred to as his photo unit. Stryker's photography project endured from 1935 to 1943. The photo unit began in the Resettlement Administration. In 1937, it was merged into the Farm Security Administration, or FSA, and was therefore known thereafter as the FSA Photo Unit. The FSA photo unit was transferred to the Office of War Information in 1942 as America mobilized for war. <clears throat> it's difficult to overstate the lasting impact of Roy Stryker's New Deal photography project. It not only produced a constant stream of photographs that supported dozens of New Deal initiatives, but it also changed the way America sees itself. It shaped the nation's collective visual memory of an era. Stryker's photo unit set the standard for all subsequent documentary pro projects. 
Roy Stryker was not a photographer, but he understood that pictures had enormous potential to reach emotions and move people to action. My father graduated from Columbia in June of 1935, just a few weeks before his 20th birthday, and Stryker immediately hired Dad as a photographer and to set up a dark room and photo lab in Washington, D.C. The plan was that Stryker would send his photo unit photographers out on assignment and their film would be processed and printed in the photo lab. Arthur was the first of more than two dozen photographers hired by Roy Stryker. You could see that's Roy over there and that's Russell Lee and that's my dad and that's John Vashon. They're very famous photographers. Despite his excellent education, Arthur had not traveled outside of the New York City area and had not learned to drive. He was a city kid who took public transportation. While on assignment, my dad traveled by car with cameras, film, and photo equipment. There were few interstate highways back then, so he often took back roads and was prepared to sleep in his car. He also had an axe to remove trees that fell across his path, and he had a shovel to dig his way out of snow or mud, and he had a coffee percolator and a portable Coleman stove. He spent most of the next seven years driving around the United States on photo assignments that could last for weeks or months. This map from the Yale Photogrammer website, which you should really check out because it's quite amazing, shows the areas Arthur traveled and visited on assignment for the photo unit. If you look, all these little purple dots and, and shapes, that's where Dad went. He went all over the country. This resettlement administration map shows the projects that Stryker was promoting across the country. He believed that by combining words with pictures, he could create persuasive visual evidence to help convince Congress and the American public that there was a real need for government action in response to the Great Depression. We refer to the photo unit photographers as social documentary photographers because their images were used to document and draw attention to ongoing social issues. Roy Stryker supplied photographs without charge to magazines and to newspapers. Here's a good example. This 1936 New York Times story about the Dust Bowl that used Dad's images. As an academic, Stryker ran his photo unit like a college seminar. He expected his photographers to thoroughly research each assignment. He trained them to be reporters with cameras who could use words and pictures to tell compelling stories. There was a lot of reading, even quizzes, and Dad loved it. In our brief time today, I'll show you how Arthur Rothstein's photographs were used in support of several New Deal initiatives. Some addressed economic and, and employment issues. Others addressed ecological and social challenges the nation faced during the 1930s and the early 40s. Many of these social, many of these New Deal initiatives achieved lasting impact through the war years and even to the present day. I'll tell you about those. Let's start with this remarkable image of a poster photographed by my father at a rally for the unemployed in Southeast Kansas. The language remains surprisingly familiar and pertinent today. The New Deal, of course, is the term President Roosevelt used to summarize his multifaceted response to the nation's ills that included components of relief, recovery, and reform. The term New Deal is a reference to playing cards, but the metaphor was rarely illustrated so explicitly. Two hands have been dealt. While labor holds the low hand, capital wins with four aces. You could see there's the capital, four aces, the low hand, labor. Under the New Deal, FDR promised to reshuffle that deck and redistribute social benefits and economic opportunity. 
the depression was characterized by high unemployment, the collapse of farm commodity prices, and the increasing mechanization of farms that displaced countless tenant farmers. Unemployment peaked above 20% in 1933, and wheat prices crashed. They were almost $2.50 a bushel in the 20s, and then dropped to less than 50 cents a bushel by the early 30s. Here's an example of tenant families displaced by the changing farm economy. During late 1938, owners of many large cotton farms in southeastern Missouri decided to mechanize production. They announced that hundreds of sharecropper and tenant farm families would be evicted on January 1st. Most of the evicted families, both black and white, had lived and worked on these cotton farms for generations. They organized a high-profile protest, piling their meager belongings along, pi along miles of highway and camping out in the winter cold. The protest and the resulting national publicity, including photographs that Arthur Rothstein sent to Washington, D.C. offices of the Farm Security Administration, embarrassed state and local officials. When my father was documenting the protest, the Missouri State Highway Patrol uh, arrived and forced the protesting families to move away from the road. This picture story got the attention of Eleanor Roosevelt. She wrote about the plight of the families in her daily newspaper column, My Day, and encouraged President Roosevelt to help. The FSA soon provided emergency grants and constructed several clusters of housing in the area for the dispossessed sharecroppers. The Dust Bowl, shown in Arthur Rothstein's most famous images, didn't develop overnight. He also photographed the drought conditions, widespread po poor farming practices, and soil erosion that made dust storms so prevalent. The booming wheat prices of the 1920s, combined with increased mechanization of farming, prompted the creation of vast new farms. About a million acres of drought-resistant prairie grass were plowed under. You see in this picture, you could see how this is prairie grass, and this has been plowed under. Farmers could harvest these endless fields of wheat using tractors or using more traditional forms of horsepower. In the 1920s, several wet years created the illusion that the region was ideal for heavy cultivation. However, it turns out that the Great Plains had experienced cycles of multi-year droughts for centuries. Even in good years, most of the annual rain came in torrents. Without the sturdy prairie grass holding the soil in place, the result was severe erosion. Erosion left the topsoil exposed and vulnerable to wind. Each rain caused further erosion. The exposed topsoil contributed to severe dust storms. On this farm, extreme erosion had ruined the land. In order to survive, literally to avoid starvation, the boy's family was forced to migrate in search of greener pastures. My father's photograph was stylized for this Postal Service cover commemorating the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. By 1935, there had been several years of severe drought in the western United States. High winds in the region contributed to major dust storms. The worst dust storm occurred on April 14th, 1935, which became known as Black Sunday, a truly cataclysmic event. Repeated dust storms blanketed the plains over a period of years. The most severely affected area in red was the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles and the neighboring parts of New Mexico, Colorado, and Kansas. Despite his youth and limited experience, Dad was charged with documenting a disaster of biblical proportions. His photographs gave visual proof of the brutal conditions. 
this picture, you can see in this picture, a car is being chased. It's being chased by a giant dust storm. His pictures conveyed the darkness and foreboding of the, of the dust bowl and the fortitude of people confronting drought and desperation. It's beautiful portraits. If you're wondering how the photographers found their subjects, well, sometimes by their own initiative, and most often through the agency's local offices, the local government agents would make it their business to know people like Mr. Huffman, proprietor of a failing hardware store that once anchored the community. The local agents also knew the families who had to relocate from land that would that was then it became submarginal and could no longer sustain a farm or a, or a ranch. Hundreds of thousands of acres were labeled submarginal. In the drought areas, rain or the lack of rain was a constant obsession. You can't see this, but over here it says Methodist Church on the top of that little building. So sweet. Heat waves and drought delayed the harvest, allowing plagues of grasshoppers to devour what crops remained. I don't know if you could see it, but there's a grasshopper right over there. The Resettlement Administration and the Farm Security Administration offered immediate help to those in the most desperate circumstances. The Soil Conservation Services helped people remain on their land if possible. Despite desperate circumstances, many farmers were determined to remain on the land. Where the land could not produce, farms collapsed and people left. Dispossessed farmers saw their possessions go on the auction block. Thousands of families took to the road. This map shows the primary westward migration routes from drought and dust storm areas, all leading west. Some had motor powered vehicles and others only had horse drawn wagons. Boy, those are some skinny horses. These scenes were common on the major westward migration routes. Here's a tenant farmer on the road. Traveling during the scorching summer heat was particularly difficult. Oh, look at this little guy, he's got a broken arm. Look at him, Oh. Especially with children. My dad encountered Vernon Evans on the road. Evans hoped to arrive in time for hop picking season in Oregon. He told dad that he could make about 200 miles a day in his Model T Ford. Some states tried to prevent migrants from entering in search of work. President Roosevelt took a lengthy re-election re campaign tour through the drought area during the scorching summer of 1936. He was aware of the drought conditions and the exodus of families from the Great Plains. He mobilized the government to respond. What's, what's to be done? What could be done? In addition to helping displaced workers, New Deal agencies supported local drought committees. The Resettlement Administration created programs to provide loans, grants, and incentive payments to struggling farmers. These highly visible efforts provided hope that help was on the way. 
This farmer was applying for an, for an erosion prevention program. New Deal agencies encouraged farmers who received loans to be better stewards of the land. Oh, what a cutie. The Resettlement Administration designed programs to help the dispossessed, people who often had to camp in unsanitary conditions along roadsides and creeks. The government set up dozens of labor camps. They provided decent shelter in areas where large numbers of workers were needed to plant or harvest crops. Exhausted and desperate migrant workers often arrived at these sanitary camps after weeks or months living in squalid, dangerous conditions without, without running water or proper sanitation. These government camps charged modest rents, but if you had no money, you could pay your share by working. My father made a series of intimate portraits of the residents of the FSA, my, of one of the, one of the FSA migrant camps he visited. His portraits humanize workers and their families who were often vilified with disparaging terms like Okies or Arkies. They were just people who, through no fault of their own, needed help that only the government could provide. Some of his portraits showed camp residents going about their daily activities and children getting proper care and nutrition. The camps provided healthy recreational activities for people of all ages. There's a bingo game. With their dignity and strength restored, these farm worker families could move on when they felt they were ready. For many families who stayed on the land despite the hardships or were, re or were relocated to sub from submarginal land, the government provided extensive report, uh, support. <clears throat> Sorry. And speaking of those who stayed, despite the hardships, whatever happened to those Cobo boys who were caught up in the Oklahoma Dust Bowl? My dad returned to Oklahoma on the 25th anniversary of his famous Dust Bowl photograph. Here are Milton and Darrell, once the little boys in my father's famous 1936 Dust Bowl pictures. Miraculously, the Coble family had remained on their land and somehow survived the years of dust and drought. Dad visited the Cobles again to shoot the 40th anniversary story of the Dust Bowl for National Geographic. Here are, Dil are Milton and Daryl Coble on their formerly dust-choked wheat field with the next generation of this intrepid Oklahoma farm family. <clears throat> now let's shift gears and briefly look at some New Deal infrastructure projects that Arthur Rothstein documented for the FSA photo unit. President Roosevelt launched the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1933 and created the Rural Electrification Administration in 1935. The TVA motto was progress through resource development. The REA extended electric service to millions of rural family farms and ranches. In 1935, only 11% of American farms had electricity. Rural people recognized that electric power could improve the efficiency of arduous tasks like sheep shearing. Wow, that looks arduous, all right. The REA was a classic example of the can-do, New Deal spirit of evidence-based experimentation. After in after investor-owned utilities failed to extend power lines to rural areas, the REA began organizing nonprofit electric cooperatives with great success. 
By 1943, the REA had loaned almost $500 million, equivalent to about $9 billion in 2022, to local governments and nonprofit REA cooperatives. Within 10 years, the percentage of rural, of rural farms with electricity had risen from 11% to above 90%. The night the lights came on was a momentous anniversary for generations of farm families ranking in importance with births and marriages. This is such a lovely picture. So these ladies are looking at plans uh, to see when electricity would come to their farm. Do you see the REA motto up there, sign up there? And here they are. I love her body language. Great. Congress authorized creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority as part of FDR's New Deal in 1933. It was designed to be both a power company and a regional economic development agency. It reshaped the economy, the landscape, and the flow of water along the Tennessee River and its tributaries. The TVA constructed 16 hydroelectric dams by 1944. The TVA also helped local municipalities attract industry with affordable electricity. Affordable power from TVA plants contributed to the rapid electricity electrification of the region, including rural areas. The first household appliance purchases after electrification were typically a lightweight electric iron and a radio. I love this woman. She's got her electric fan, her presser, her radio. Oh, there she is, a farm wife at work. The prosperity of this northern this nor, northern Alabama town on the Tennessee River resulted from the rapid growth of employment by the TVA. Construction of nearly of, oh construction of two nearby dams employed thousands of workers from Florence, Alabama. This is Florence, Alabama. You could see they were doing so well. They had, everyone had nice shiny cars. They were shopping, they're, they're holding shopping bags. There are, there are people at the cafe. Thank you to the TVA. Affordable power generated at TVA. Hydroelectric plants made the region attractive to industry and even to the U.S. military. The TVA's hydropower dams provided electricity that attracted manufacturers, defense-related plants, and many other businesses to the region. Arthur Rothstein submitted hundreds of photographs of TVA projects to the FSA files. You could see these guys were farmers, and now they have a job working for the TVA. By 1934, just one year after its creation, the TVA already employed 9,000 people. Construction employment at TVA projects was a lifeline during the Great Depression. It re and it reached a peak of more than 28,000 workers at the time Dad made this photo in 1942. I'll wrap up by revealing some lesser known aspects of the enduring New Deal legacy. Up to the present day, people continue to benefit indirectly from the FSA health care program and directly from the work of the TVA and the electric utilities constructed by the REA. Here's a little known legacy of the New Deal migrant worker program. When the FSA determined that half of all farm loan defaults resulted from borrower illness, the agency developed health care clinics and low-cost regional medical cooperatives. In the 1930s, farmers without health insurance were always one illness or one injury away from losing their farm. The FSA medical cooperatives were good for farm families and provided a steady income for rural doctors. 
The program became a testing ground for a universal health insurance program, but Congress never approved national health care legislation proposed by the new dealers. However, when Congress defunded the FSA, health care programs in the 1940s, several key experts moved north and developed the Saskatchewan Social Health Program. It became the model for the universal coverage provided under the Canadian National Health System. Oh my. Most people appreciate the benefits of the New Deal's nationwide electrification projects. Fewer people know that the TVA's hydropower dams were critical to the Allied victory in World War II. As I mentioned earlier, Stryker's New Deal photo unit was absorbed by the Office of War Information as America mobilized for war. In June of 1942, Arthur Rothstein photographed several TVA dams for the Office of War Information. Stryker himself joined Dad on this assignment, which was highly unusual. Meanwhile, leaders of the top secret Manhattan Project were evaluating whether the area could support an enormous facility dedicated to uranium enrichment for the atomic bomb. In retrospect, I understand why Dad took so many photos of the central Tennessee Valley. The military's assessment of the area for its suitability as a site of a multi-billion dollar bomb-making facility required a lot of photographic documentation. In September of 1942, just a couple of months after Dad completed his big TVA photo assignment, Dr. Leslie, I'm sorry, General, Leslie Groves selected a site for, for construction of a secret city that became Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The site was chosen because TVA could provide abundant electric power to the massive project. Well, I think that's it. I think we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, thanks, Annie. Um, I think we're just going to go back to you, so um, you can stop sharing your screen. Okie dokie. Getting lots of rave reviews in the chat. Oh, super duper. So I, I want to be the first to thank you personally for a really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And we do have a lot of questions. So um, I just want to start because um, people, several people have asked whether this uh, presentation is being recorded and where they can see it or share it. Um, it's going to be on our Facebook page, Living New Deal, and it's also going to be posted to the Living New Deal website, and that's livingnewdeal.org. And if you go there and you um, search for webinars, you'll see the whole series of webinars that we've done over the past year. And this one will probably be up in the next week or so. Fantastic. So tune in, you'll, you'll get to see anything you missed. <laughs> um, one of the questions that came up where I'd like to start is what kind of cameras did um, Arthur Rothstein use? Do you know? Uh, well, yes, I do. Uh, he used um, the the, the camera that all press photographers used, which was the, the graphic, the speed graphic. He also loved his smaller, more compact cameras that became very popular, uh, the Leica. He loved his Leica camera and uh, the contact. He used his contact. What else did he use? He used... Uh, his Icon to B, oh my gosh, I almost forgot. So the Icon to B was a square format um, image and uh, he took his dust ball picture with that, with the Icon to B. Hey, yeah, uh, he, yeah. used all, he used all kinds of cameras. He used cameras on tripods, uh, around his neck. I mean, he just, everything. He, he, he loved the, um, uh, the, uh, the timer, the self timer. He loved that any excuse to jump into the picture. He just loved it. <laughs> okay, let me let me get into some other other questions that people have asked. Um, so um, 
did the government ever sponsor another photo project like Stryker's FSA photo unit? Oh, wow. You know, it's interesting you should say that because the documentary, the, it was called uh, Documerica. Yeah. And uh, it was developed by the newly formed Environmental Protection Agency under Nixon in the 1970s. Uh, in November of 71, the agency announced plans for this Im ambitious documentary project that would commission photographs showing evidence of a changing American environment. And um, uh, wow, they. <laughs> Documentary, so Documerica was the brainchild of, of a guy named Gifford Hampshire, and he was a photo editor and greatly admired, he greatly admired the FSA photo project, and um, so Dad was hired to design and launch Documerica, and they, they eventually sent 75 photographers on 115 extended assignments to all 50 states plus Puerto Rico. Uh, unfortunately, um, it only was around from 1972 to 1974, uh, they, they had their money um, cut back, their budget was cut back, and Documerica, that was the end of Documerica. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, um, the pictures, however, the pictures from Documerica have been digitized by the National Archive and are available online. So that might be interesting if somebody wants to go look at them. Yeah, somebody asked earlier about, um, you mentioned a Yale photo website. Can you put oh. that in the chat? That is so cool. Yeah, um, it's called the Photogrammer. Okay, so it, it can be found online at Photogrammer. Yes. At Yale. Yes. Okay. Easy to find and so much fun. You could put in the name of a photographer and it will show you, just like I, I had that, that picture with, with all of the places Dad uh, went. That uh, map actually yeah. with all the picture, all the places down. It'll show you any photographer, any of the FSA photographers, where they went, and where and when they were there. It's just amazing. It's an amazing thing. Um. So, could you tell us? Did your dad always want to be a photographer? You mentioned um, that he was interested in it when he was in school, but did he study it then? Uh, he actually wanted to be a doctor, like his favorite uncle, who gave him his, his camera, who gave him his first camera for his bar mitzvah. And together they built a dark room in the basement of uh, the house that he grew up in, in the Bronx. Um, so he, it was always, photography was always his passion, but he, he never studied photography. At Columbia, he majored in chemistry and physics, and he planned to be, he really planned to go to medical school, but it was the middle of the Great Depression and expensive, so when Roy Stryker offered him this great opportunity, um, he took it and thought, well, maybe someday I'll come back and I'll go to, Gro no, he just became a photographer. It was such a wonderful experience. and. Roy Stryker really changed his direction, the direction of his whole life. Um, you know, I've seen so, so many of, um, and there's a couple of questions to this effect, of Dorothea Lange's photographs and the fact that she did these amazing captions where she either interviewed the people and she hand wrote these captions that appeared um, later in, um, you know, in her archive, but also in, um, the reports that she and her husband produced. And I'm wondering, um, and there's a question to this effect, did, um, did uh, Rothstein write his captions by hand or did he use a typewriter or? <laughs> um, they all took field notes um, and um, uh, they would send their film in um, or the film would get back to Washington DC. It would be processed, it would be uh, printed and then put on cards. And then when the photographer finished their assignment, they would come into the home office, they called it, and they would take their field notes and they would sit down with the big pile of, of cards of pictures and they would write down their, uh, their titles and their captions uh, 
that's how they did it. Um, early on in the in the presentation, you, you showed a picture of Rothstein with some of his colleagues. Um, Jean Bichon was one of them, Russell Lee. Um, I'm wondering, did he know some of these other photographers like Dorothea or Gordon Park? Oh, yes, they were did all have... very good friends. They were all dear friends, and he remained extremely friendly with them uh, till the end of his life. Um, or their life if they died before he did. But um, yeah, they, they were like a little club. They, they really hung out together. Um, we had parties at my parents' house where they would come and visit and, and show up and take pictures of everybody. It was just, they were celebrity photographers and it was a real treat when they showed up and with their cameras around their neck. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, um, did your dad know John Ford, or did he have anything to do, or did he know John Steinbeck, for that matter, when it came to that movie, The Grapes of Wrath? It's so much of what he captured in photography looks like it's, it was the, the inspiration for the movie. Well, uh, funny you should say that, because um, uh, when Steinbeck was working on his novel, he made a trip to Washington, D.C. to check out the files at the Farm Security Administration, and he studied Dad's Dust Bowl photographs. And those images encouraged his creativity and helped him tell the story of the Jode family's exodus to California after being forced to leave their farm in the Dust Bowl in, in Oklahoma. So, yes, he definitely had a relationship with with the the story of the grapes of wrath i don't know if he ever met john steinbeck or not yeah it, i think it's just so interesting that 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 very uh, stylized look of the time with the black and white films and those close-up portraits it just seemed like it was of a piece yes and we have photographs that um of mom and dad, Jode people, mom and pa, I guess it was, mom and pa, Jode looking people who you could see. I mean, these, this was the real life Jode family. Fascinating how, um, how these people actually existed and dad photographed them and uh, Steinbeck saw these pictures and said, yeah, I, could, I got it. This is the story I'm gonna tell. Um, early on in your presentation, you showed this amazing photograph of people with their belongings all lined up along oh, the boys. Heartbreaking. And you said that um, in some cases, they encountered law enforcement. And I'm wondering whether um, Arthur Rossine ever ran into any kind of conflicts with law enforcement when he was trying to take pictures that um, the officials didn't want shown. Yes, that happened many times. <laughs> he he uh, had his camera taken away from him. He uh, other times he, he was chased by the KKK. He told me at one point um, he uh, he had a lot of exciting uh, moments as a photographer. But he was extremely diplomatic, very calm, and uh, I think that helped him a great deal in those scary situations. He was also a diplomat for the Jewish people. I'll tell you a short story. When dad was sent out to, to the Brewster Ranch to photograph life on a ranch and the cowboys and just fantastic pictures he got from that assignment. Months later, Mr. Brewster happened to be in Washington, D.C., and he came by uh, Roy Stryker's office and he said, uh, Mr. Stryker, I just want to thank you for sending Arthur Rothstein to my ranch. He was just wonderful. You know, we had been quite anti-Semitic at our ranch, but when we saw how Arthur worked, our anti-Semitism just left us. Wow. So I thought that was a great story. And Dad didn't tell me that story. That's a story that Roy told. Interesting. So they were ambassadors as well. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, the, the Legacy Project and does it include, in addition to the New Deal years, does it include other uh, work that Rothstein did after the Depression? Yes. So Dad's uh, first part of his career was a government photographer. Then uh, he was 
a, an officer during the war. Uh, he was the chief photographer in China for the Signal Corps. And when the Signal Corps, when the uh, war ended, he was still in China. He couldn't get home because there was a, a, a lot of people, uh, transportation snafu. Everybody was trying to leave China at the same time. So he took a short assignment for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. So we've got those photographs. And um, right now we have an exhibition. Uh, we have two exhibitions, actually, uh, that focus on a story that dad photographed in China of uh, a community of 18,000 Jews who managed to escape Europe and spend the war years in China. It's a fascinating story. And um, so, uh, so dad did that, and then he came home, and then he worked at Look Magazine until it until uh, it folded in 1971, and he was the director of photography and technical director and chief of photography at Look. And then uh, he did the same thing at Parade Magazine after Look folded, and he, he worked at Look at uh, Parade Magazine, which at the time had the largest circulation of any magazine because it was in your Sunday newspaper. It still is, I believe. So dad, you know, so, so dad had a long career and at the, um, and what we do, what Brody and I do, is we try to introduce new audiences to dad's entire career. And we do that with exhibitions and lectures like this one, illustrated lectures and classes and courses. And it's so much fun because he had such a diverse and interesting career. Um, one of the questions that came up, um, um, I think is really interesting. You, you hear so much now and we're seeing so much war photography. Um, and the question that has to do with, were there any projects that Rothstein worked on that were particularly searing or, or wrenching to him? Did, did he ever share with you some, you know, something that was especially difficult? Gee. I'm sure he did, but I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> China. Well, he would talk about China, and to, you know, it was there were millions of people walking around uh, who were starving to death. He was there during a famine, and he said he would walk by a little child sitting by the side of the road with chopsticks in his hand, and then when he walked back the other way, the child was dead. Like this is like people were on the verge of dying. There were people were dying in front of him. And he said that that, that was extremely upsetting to, to not be able to do anything to help these people other than tell their story with photographs, which is what he did. I mean, he always hoped that his photographs would, would move people. That's, he was a social documentary photographer. Um, did um, Rothstein take the photographs of G's Bend, Alabama? Yes, he did. And was that uh, part of the FSA work he did? Yes, it was. Yeah, he he went to G's Bend and um, and he documented uh, this in this isolated community uh, and the families that lived there and worked the the land, and they had a unique thing, which was that the women folk in G's Bend made quilts, and they made quilts out of bits of old overalls and you know, whatever fabric they could find, remnants and so forth. They made these works of art, just absolutely magnificent works of art. Uh, and, uh, and so Dad, he was focusing on what was going on in the community, not just the ladies making the quilts, but he did get some really great shots of, of uh, the quilts and people making quilts. And uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a lovely assignment. Yeah, I had the opportunity to see some of those amazing quilts. There was an exhibit here at the Beyond of those, of those quilts and the women making them as well. Oh, it, there was a fantastic show at the Whitney, I think it was in 2000, uh, and um, 
the people who organized the show brought in a busload of the women who made the quilts and their children who, who were taught how to make the quilts, aunts, whatever, all these ladies were on this bus. And I was invited to meet the bus at the museum. And when they got off the bus and they found out who I was, they hugged me and kissed me. I was like, <laughs> dad embodied, you know, in this little lady. And it was just the most fabulous experience. They, and they held my hand and walked around the, the, to show me which quilts they made and which and who made what. And it was a fantastic event. Yeah, they even made a record of them of their songs of their yeah really. the gospel songs that they made while they were doing the quilting. Yeah. Um. So I know we're running out of time, but I have a couple other questions I wanted to ask. Um. One here says, growing up as a kid. Um, did your did did you see a lot of photographs that your dad had? Were they hanging on the walls of your house? Oh, completely covered. Yes, our walls were covered with photographs. Um, yeah, we we grew up with a lot of pictures, and um, and we understood that dad was a photographer, and my mom was a photographer. You know, my mom was the official photographer for New Rochelle, which was the community we grew up in, New Rochelle, New York. And she had a uh, a portrait studio. Did you know um, how important and amazing his photographs were, and how of course not history? Of course not. I wish I did. I, oh, gee, Susan, I really wish I did. I, I thought anybody could do this. You know, I had no idea. Did he take pictures of your family? Oh, in fact, we took uh, two official photographs a year. One was called the birthday pictures. Three out of the four kids were all born in the same week, different years, of course. And so uh, the fourth kid had an, had an unofficial birthday. And my dad and mom would get four cakes, and they had our names on it. And we would stand in front of the cakes, and they would take our picture every year. So we had, and then they went up the, they went up the stairs. Up, and um, then the other picture was called the Christmas picture, nice Jewish family. And that was taken, that was the holiday picture, but we called it the Christmas picture. And that was us, each person holding a antique camera, because my dad had an amazing antique camera collection. And those also went up the wall. So we had these two sets of pictures going up the wall for 30 years, something like that. And are all these in the, in the collection at the Legacy Project? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the most amazing book, because I don't know how many other families are documented as well as my family. <laughs> I think I think my father my father might have been competing with you. Really? <laughs> oh. Annie, thank you. This has just been a joy, and I so appreciate you being part of our webinar series. And Annie's also um, a national associate for the Living New Deal, and um, and she just contributes so much to our knowledge and appreciation of the New Deal. And it's- It's always a pleasure, Susan. I love the Living New Deal. I love what you're trying to do. And tomorrow, uh, the, the Living New Deal New York City chapter is having John Reddick uh, a tour of Harlem. Uh, it's gonna be absolutely fantastic. So we're always doing things with, with the Living New Deal. I love doing things for the Living New Deal. Thank you for everything you've done, Susan. Well, thank you, Annie, and thank you, Brody, for being behind the scenes. <laughs> He's here. He's right here. <laughs> I wanna thank everybody who joined us on the call today. I hope that you'll come back to us in September for a whole new series of webinars. Please stay safe out there and um, take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night.